God's word to Matthew and the chapter number nine. These verses uh, are very special verses to me. These are the verses that the Lord called me in the Bible college uh, through and actually into this ministry through. And I give thanks to the Lord for them and we want to study them this morning. Matthew 9 and 36. When Christ saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted, were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for thy living word. Speak to hearts today. Speak to young people today. We thank you for the teenagers and the gathering, for the young people, the children here. Speak to the seniors, speak to the middle age, speak to those, Lord, just starting out in adult life. We pray, Lord, that thy voice will be heard today, that thou wilt minister above the voice of man. Oh, Lord, we pray you'll bring us to the place where we are surrendered to do whatever God would call us to do. Help us not to hold back this morning. But to say, here I am, Lord, wholly available. Wherever you want me to be, I'll be. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do. Oh, Lord, may we hear thine instruction today. Empty me of self and sin and fill me with thy spirit. Give me help to be faithful to thy word and to this congregation. For Christ's precious name we pray. Amen and amen. Last week we considered the compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ 
for the lost in sin around him in verse number 36. He saw the multitude. He was moved with compassion. He wasn't the only one there. And I think we have to highlight that. We have to note that. But he was the one who had compassion. And last week we finished by saying, may the Lord give us a heart of compassion. And may the Lord give us spiritual vision, not just to walk among the lost with a hard heart, but to walk among the lost with a heart that seeks to win them. A genuine burden, such as the saviors that resulted in him putting into action a plan that would reach sinners with the gospel. And what the Lord does, being moved with compassion, he speaks to his people. And you know, when there's a work to be done for the Lord and the lost are to be saved, we need to go to the people of God. We can't go to the unsaved because they can't help themselves and they certainly can't help anyone else. But we go to the people of God. And here's the message that the Lord gave in verses 37, 38. And I want us to break it into four simple thoughts. And I trust and pray the Lord will bless your heart and challenge your heart today. And that whatever he saith unto you, you will do it. First of all, I want you to notice the prospect. The prospect, because it says in verse 37, Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous. The harvest truly is plenteous. Now, what do we mean by the word harvest? Well, in its most simple form, it is a gathering in of those things that have grown. So, for example, we can have a fruit harvest or we can have a crop harvest. Whenever those things are fully grown and are ripe for picking, then we go out and we gather in the harvest, whether it's a small harvest or whether it is a large harvest. Now, in the word of God, the word harvest refers to several scenarios. So, for example, we have the literal harvest. We think of the harvest field of grain or whatever crop is being brought in, the barley or whatever. And we think of the book of Ruth. And the last chapter of the book of Ruth, it takes place in the harvest field. And during the time of harvest when the grain was being brought in. Then we think, secondly, of the harvest of God's judgment. And we think of verses such as Hosea chapter 6 verse 11, which says, O Judah, he hath set an harvest for thee. We think of verses such as Joel 3 verse number 13. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe for their wickedness is great. And there is that harvest whenever the Lord is going to gather all into him. And during that time of reaping, there's going to be a division. Those who are holy and true, those who are saved and those who are lost. And the saved will be brought into fellowship in God's house eternally and the lost to hell for everlasting punishment. The wheat and the tares will be separated at that harvest judgment. There's also the harvest of reward in Scripture because the Word of God tells us in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And therefore, there's that idea of a harvest in our lives. And what you sow in your life today will be reaped either this evening, tomorrow, next week, maybe it'll be years' time. But you do reap what you sow. And an example of this is if you use your mind to think of wicked or evil or immoral thoughts or sinful things against other people, then you're going to reap what you've sown. It may not be today. It may not be tomorrow. But as your mind lingers on and those thoughts grow into desires, those desires will grow into actions unless you pray for the Lord to deliver you and cleanse you from such thoughts and keep your mind pure and holy for his glory. But I'll tell you, you see, if you fill your mind with Christ, and with his word, and with the principles of the word of God, and with the commands of the word of God, and set your mind to know this is wisdom, you will reap what you sow, because you will live a life that is pleasing and honorable unto the Lord. Friend, if you seek to reach people with the gospel, then you will reap a great reward. Then there is a harvest of the soul winner in scripture, and that is bringing the gospel to sinners and seeing them brought to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ by the work of the Holy Spirit. And the context of this passage is not people being sent out to judgment, but rather it's being sent out to save people from judgment, to bring the gospel, to bring the good news that there is a Savior who truly saves. 
And friend, we all can be a part of the harvest of the soul winner if we are saved. This is something that is essential. It's something that is important. And as I have read, even the various missions that we're going to be having in our congregation this year in the will of the Lord, are you ready to say, I will work in the field today? I will be a worker in the field because the harvest is plenteous. Now, if you turn with me to John chapter 4, verse number 35, we find that this theme is brought up again. John chapter 4, verse number 35. And the Lord is speaking, and he says, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap on whereon you bestowed no labor, other men labored and ye are entered into their labors. What do we realize from these verses? First of all, there's no time for delay. Don't say four months and then the harvest. Four months and then I'll work. Four months and then I'll be concerned about my loved ones and my neighbors and my community. But the word of God says, lift up your eyes and look onto the fields. They're white. They're ready to harvest. There is a work to be done. Now, if a farmer doesn't go out whenever it is time for the harvest and he rests and he is lazy for weeks and weeks and weeks. You know what's going to happen? The opportunity to get that harvest is going to be lost. Now we rejoice that there will be none lost for whom Christ has died. All the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. However, you through laziness may lose the blessing of being a soul winner, a worker in the field. And therefore the Lord will use someone else, and you'll miss out on the great blessing that there is. You will notice it says, he that rece reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal. There is a reward. Oh, it's not the reward of this world. It's the spiritual reward. And we will receive the soul winner's crown. We'll be rewarded in ways that we cannot even fathom when we get to heaven. But notice this, we enter into other people's labors. One soweth and other reapeth. Verse 37, I sent you to be to reap that whereon ye bestow no labor. Other men labored and ye are entered into their labors. And it's important for us to remember that it doesn't start and end with us, but we often enter in to other people's labors. And how wonderful we're thankful for those who have gone before us in our lives and the ministry in this congregation who have sown the seed. Some of them are home in glory now. Some of them not able to be at the house of God, yet they have sown the seed, and we have come behind. We've entered into their labors. And it's all for the glory of the Lord. The very first mention of the word harvest in Scripture is found in Genesis chapter 8. And there's a lovely thought regarding this, and it says in Genesis chapter 8, While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. Now, I'm not going to bounce off and speak about climate change, but there's the verse to go to when it's brought before you. The Lord is in charge. And this world will end when the trumpet sounds. It will not be because of climate issues. It will be because of the word of the one who made the world and the one who's sustaining the world to this day. However, it does say that harvest time shall not cease. And that's true of the physical harvest. Oh yes, there are famines in certain parts of the world, but there's always a harvest. There's always food. God has always provided for this earth. But isn't it wonderful to think that this is true spiritually. As long as this earth remaineth, 
the harvest of souls shall not cease. Because only when the last one is gathered in, then the trump shall sound. Then time shall be no more. And praise God, we have this promise that there will be success in the harvest because there is a harvest of souls to gather for the Savior. Not only that, this is a mission with guaranteed success. I've already quoted the verse, all the Father giveth me shall come to me. The Lord isn't going to send you into the harvest field and he isn't going to put a burden in your heart for souls to mock you. But because there's a work to be done, there are sheaves to be brought in, there are people to be saved and therefore our duty is to labor and to leave the results with the Lord. We labor and pray that God himself will give the increase. We see the prospect, the harvest is plenteous. Secondly, the problem, the laborers are few. Matthew 9, 37. The laborers are few. Now, the word laborers is an interesting word in the Greek. It means a toiler or a worker in the immediate context. But it also can figuratively mean a teacher. And that's significant here. Because if people are going to hear the word of God, they need to be taught or told the word of God from someone who knows what it is. And therefore, the teachers are few, the workers are few, the toilers are few. Now, there are people today working in this world, but they're not faithful workers. There are people today even working in church circles, and they're not true workers. We are warned of such people in the New Testament. Um, for example, the word laborers is translated as workers in 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen, where Paul warns of deceitful workers. And also in Philippians 3, verse 2, evil workers. Could there be an evil worker in the church? Well, yes. There can be people come into churches who are not saved, and they're actually doing the work of the devil. We see people standing in pulpits today who are not saved. They are doing the work of the devil. They are deceitful workers. They are evil workers. But where the word work is used elsewhere in Scripture, we can see some truths about those who would work for the Lord. Turn with me to John chapter 4. Or sorry, John chapter 9. John chapter 9 and verse number 4. Here is some things that we can learn about what it means to be a worker. Well, we take the example of the Savior. In John, John chapter 9, verse 4. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. We have a limited time to work for the Lord. We have a limited time to work for the Lord. You know those are glasses that often are used to time things? Well, that was turned over whenever your life began. I don't know how long you've left until your time runs out and the last of the sand goes through the hourglass and you're called home. But I do know this time is short. We're not even guaranteed so much as tomorrow. So therefore this morning, my prayer is that the Holy Spirit would write upon your heart and my heart that there's a limited time to work for the Lord. And even should you have a long life, you may not always have the ability to work for the Lord. You may not always be mobile. You may not always have the mental capacity. You may not always have the time. And therefore, the Lord said, I must work the works of him that sent me. Friend, if the Lord has called you to something, you be there. If the Lord has called you by his word and by his spirit to do something for him, you do it with all your heart and you do it now. Because the night is coming when no man can work. Turn over to Romans chapter 13. We find something else that should mark such workers. Romans chapter 13 and verse number 12. And it says there in Romans chapter 13, verse number 12, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of of light. And whenever you read on down that passage, it says in verse number 14, put 
on, put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, be Christ-like. And it says in verse 12, cast off the works of darkness. The workers of the Lord, the believers, the saved of God, who are called to work for him, should not be marked by works of darkness, works of sin, works of iniquity, those things that are displeasing to the Lord, those things that would cause someone to say, well, if that's a Christian, I'm not interested because they're no better than the unsaved. We are to cast off such works. We are to put on Christ. That's the way we're to live. And how great a tool in the hand of the Lord is a man or a woman whose desire is to be like Jesus. But sadly, how greatly the influence of one can be used by the devil whose desire is to appear to be the right thing, but in reality, their heart's not right at all. One more verse before we come back to our teaching. Second Timothy Chapter 2, 2 Timothy, and the chapter number 2. And we're going down to verse uh, number 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The word study there, it means be diligent or labor. Make the effort. Make the effort to show thyself approved unto God. Study the word of God. Pray, sacrifice, go through with God. These things, as you will find, will cause you not to be ashamed before him. Friend, that's our desire. That whenever we stand before the Lord, we'll not be ashamed. Oh, thank God we're saved. But let us not live with regrets of what we could have, should have, would have done. Let us do the work now. Let us be diligent now. Let us make the effort now to show ourselves approved unto the Lord. And one final verse just before we go back to Matthew. First Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians 15. This is a very important verse because Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. They're living in a secular society, a very wicked society. He is writing to the saints of the Lord there, and here's what he tells him in verse number 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now he says, therefore, and that's referring to what he has spoken beforehand. So let's go from verse number 55. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, be ye workers. What is the therefore about? It's saying, in light of the fact you're saved. In light of the fact the sting of sin has been dealt with, that you have victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. In light of the fact that you are chosen, you are justified, you're redeemed, you're cleansed, in light of that, you be a worker for the Lord. And friend, the greatest motivation for you or me is not by a preacher standing in the pulpit scolding you. It's by a preacher pointing to Calvary and saying, look what Christ has done for you. Now what can we do for him? It's love for Christ. And the more you love him, the more you read of his word, the more you spend in his presence, the greater your desire will be to work. The blessings and talents we have been given are to be used in the service of the Lord. We are to be laborers. And sadly, the laborers are few. And that's often the case. Sometimes we look at where the worker is going to come from. But how can we work as God's people in this day? Well, whatever God has given us, let us use it for his glory. Maybe God has given you the gift of hospitality. And you are able to speak to people. You're able to have people in your home. You are a very open person, a very welcoming person. You can use that for the glory of God. You're talking about the Savior in such ways or inviting such people to the house of God. The finances that you have given. The Lord tells us to use and to give and to tithe onto the work of God. We can do that for the glory of the Lord. That is part of the work of God. The abilities, whether it is uh, 
in technology or in singing or whatever it is that God has given you ability to do. This church was built by the hands of men whom God blessed with the ability to work with their hands. And therefore, we give glory to God for the workmen who stepped up at that time. We only need people later in the year to go round with our team to knock doors, to invite them into missions, to Bible conferences, to meetings. We'll need people to pray. We'll need people to go. And therefore, what the Lord has given to you, do it and use it for him. The very simple things, and some people, I have nothing I could do for the Lord. Well, everybody's the ability to read and the ability to speak. My friend, you can read the Bible that you might grow more like your Savior. You can speak in prayer. You can speak to share. You can speak to encourage. You can speak to invite. You can speak to evangelize. There's no excuse. God made your mouth as he told Moses. And he will be with you and give you the words to say. And I want to say this. This is your highest calling. Where whoever you are, whatever your background, your pedigree, your job, your position in this world, your highest calling is to serve the Lord, where he's placed you, whether in your home, your school, your college, your workplace, whether in the farm or the factory, in this church, serve him, serve him well, serve him with all your heart, serve him now. So we've seen the potential, we've seen the problem. Thirdly, let us see the prayer. And it says, verse 38, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest. And here we have a command from the Lord to pray. And I want you to look carefully here and learn this lesson well this morning. Learn this lesson well. When there is a need, pray. When there is a need, pray. Hebrews 4, 16, let us therefore come boldly onto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. We will have a time of need. We'll be living in a time of need. We will be in need until the day and the hour and the moment we are called home to heaven. We think personally of our needs. We have needs that our attitudes would be kept in check with the word of God. That our plans would be submitted to the Lord. That our hurts would not overwhelm us and cause us to be bitter. That our fears would not overwhelm us and cause us to doubt God. That our waywardness would be less and less. That our laziness would be shaken out of us. That our apathy would be transformed. We have needs in our families. There are those who are saved in our families. We need to pray they'll make wise choices in life. There are those who are not saved. We need to pray the Lord will save them. We need to pray for family uh, unity and the family circle to be completed in Christ. In our churches, we need the moving of the Lord. We need uh, growth as believers. We need to see souls saved. We need wisdom for the leadership. You need uh, wisdom for the pastor as he would seek to preach the word of God. We need protection against the attacks of God's enemy. In our land, we need laws to be changed. We need righteous judgments to be reinstated. We need God to blow on wickedness. We need people to see their danger without the Lord. In our world, we have wars, we have poverty, we have famine. God's people are suffering. God's people are under persecution. Are you praying? And this is something I want to emphasize this morning. Without apology, we need to be praying in our prayer meetings. Not sitting with gaps for ages until somebody feels uncomfortable enough to pray, but to pray. Why? Because there are people who wait to be moved to pray. Now, folks, I do not see in Scripture where that is justified. Because the Word of God says, pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 Praying always, Ephesians 6.18 There are people living in war-torn countries that we know personally. Why are we sitting in silence? Our loved ones are going to hell. Why is our voices not lifted up and the tears running down our face? I urge you. There's a verse in scripture, and it's been in my mind this week, God forbid that I would sin against thee in ceasing to pray. Can we honestly look our loved ones in the eyes and tell them we've done all we could? 
As we stand before God, can we honestly say we took every opportunity, every prayer meeting to lift our voice and use the time wisely? Or we're sitting waiting to someone else said it so we wouldn't feel uncomfortable and hope that the meeting was over very soon to we get out. I challenge each one. You pray God will give you grace to pray in the prayer meeting and I can assure you God will do it mightily. We need to pray. We need to pray. I appreciate there are those who cannot speak public in front of people and I appreciate that. I'm not getting at you in any shape or form. But there are many people who can pray publicly. We need to pray. Friend, we need to pray. If we're going to see God move in our church, we need to pray. If we see God save our loved ones, we're going to pray. And not only do we need to pray, but we need to pray with an open heart because here the prayer was send forth labors into the harvest field and the Lord used the people who prayed to be the answer to that prayer. Are you going to pray with an open heart? Lord, save my family and then be willing to be the one whom the Lord will use to reach your family. Are you going to pray, Lord, reach Uganda or reach Liberia? You might be the one the Lord uses. Are you praying with a biblical view of God? Are you praying with a biblical view of God? What do I mean by that? He's called the Lord of the harvest. And therefore, what is done in the harvest field must be done at his command. He must be honored in the work. Only God can give the increase. 2 Corinthians 3, 6. I have planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. And we go to meetings here going every single day of the year, but unless the Lord gives the increase, nothing's done. And therefore, we need to be at the prayer meeting tonight at 6.15 and pray, Lord, give the increase. We need to be Tuesday night, 8 p.m., Lord, give the increase. He is the Lord of the harvest. We need his help. We can't just labor on our own strength a little harder and hope it works. But we must pray, Lord, move. Lord, move in my family. Lord, move in my town. Move in my school. Move in my heart. And make me willing. Make me willing to be the worker. Finally, the plan. Here's the plan that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. I think it's very interesting that the Lord didn't turn around to the disciples and say, go and work in the harvest field. That's not what he said to them. He said, pray that the Lord would send laborers into the harvest field. Why? Because we know that their hearts weren't ready to do that work just yet. They didn't even see the need. They needed to pray. And in prayer, the Lord was going to change them and the Lord was going to give them a burden. And again, don't miss the pattern. We must pray before we work. If the need is so great, why not just send them on without prayer? Because prayer is needed in the work of God. Prayer is a place of power. And friend, if you're going to do something, should it be stand in the front of a children's meeting? Should it be stand in the open air? Should it be in the place of prayer? Should it be giving a testimony somewhere? Whatever it is you're going to do, be it in prayer. Then do the work. Bathe it in prayer. That's the pattern here. The Lord said, pray ye and then work. May God grant it to be so in our lives. God uses prayer to change the hearts of his people, bringing them into line with his will when we pray with an open heart. If you're laboring without prayer, you're acknowledging that you don't need God's help. And friend, that's pride. In fact, it's foolish and it's sinful. But whatever God has called you to do, bathe it in prayer. There are parents here today. And can I say my heart is thrilled to see so many children here and boys and girls. We rejoice in this. God has been so good to our congregation over this little while. But God has called you to be parents. And therefore you bathe that work in prayer. This is an important work. It's a spiritual work. And you bathe your work as mom and dad in prayer. Grandparents here today who have influence, great influence over grandchildren. You bathe that calling in prayer. There are people here today who are church members and we rejoice in it. We thank God for those who've come recently and joined their fellowship. You bathe it in prayer that you'll be a godly member of your church, a blessing, a worker. 
There are people today who are Sunday school teachers, leaders of works, committee, elders, pastor, whoever it is, whatever you're doing, whatever God has called you to be in this world, pray, pray, pray. I pray God's work must be done his way. He has given instruction on how to pray. Here there's a need for souls to be saved. We need to pray God would send forth labors, but with a heart open, Lord, do I need to go? Is it me or what can I do in the work? God sends forth laborers and he sends them to the place where he wants them to be. As we conclude this morning, here's a few thoughts. God uses ordinary people to do the work of reaching others with the gospel. These men largely were not educated. They didn't maybe stand out in their towns and their villages in Israel with any special qualifications or abilities. Just ordinary working men. That's the very people the Lord used. He used them to reach others with the gospel. Don't you say I can't go. Don't you say I couldn't be used because the Lord has a plan and a purpose for you. And we must pray that the work of the Lord will be advanced in the Lord's way. He told them to pray. And then, as we will find next week, he gave them instruction after that. And there was an answer to that prayer. And my final question this morning is this. Are you where the Lord has called you to be? Do you know for sure where God wants you to be? I'm talking spiritually. I'm talking here in this church. I'm talking in the service you're giving to him. Have you prayed? Are you sure? Will then be there with all your heart. Are you willing? Are you praying? Are you working? Oh, may God give us a burden. May God give us a true burden that doesn't allow us just to know there are people unsaved, but for heart to plead for them. And pray for the increase, God's increase. Now we could fill this place to overflowing by the plans of man. But we want God's increase. And may he give it. Our closing hymn this morning is a wonderful hymn of challenge. And it's 681. I was doing a little bit of research about this hymn at the end of last year. It was written in Canada by a lady who went to teach in a very remote part of Canada as a missionary teacher. And she actually wrote two hymns. And in the first verse of the hymn, and I always wondered why the tone changes suddenly in the middle of this hymn. So send I you to labor on, reward it, to serve unpaid, unloved, unsought, unknown, to bear rebuke and suffer scorn and scoffing. So send I you to toil for me alone. And you can see in the first two verses, really, there's a negative aspect of service. And the things that you maybe suffer if you go and serve the Lord. And it's quite a neck. And this was actually uh, five or six verses long, the original song. But years later, after her service, she wrote the hymn again. And it was written in a positive light. And that positive light comes in there in verse uh, number three. So send I you to take to souls in bondage the word of truth that sets the captive free. So really, verses 1 and 2 are the negative way, I suppose, of looking at serving. Verses 3, 4, and 5, she has seen that serving is a blessing. And my prayer is this morning that as we sing this, the Lord will speak to our heart and give us a task to do for his glory. Let's stand and worship the Lord.
our heads in prayer, so send I you my strength to know in weakness, my joy in grief, my perfect peace in pain, to prove my power, my grace, my promised presence, so send I you eternal fruit again. Friend, are you willing to go? Are you willing to be part of the work team? Are you willing to serve? Oh, you'll not lose out. I can assure you that. God is no man's debtor. But there's joy in serving Jesus. Will you come? Heavenly Father, we leave that challenge before God's people today. Oh, Lord, help us to say, here am I. Lord, here am I. I'm willing today. Wherever, whatever, whenever, Lord, I'm willing to obey. Oh, we pray that you'll breathe upon our times of prayer. We pray you'll breathe upon our services. Oh, Lord, give us such a fragrance of Christ about our lives that people will know that we're saved. And use us, Lord, whether it be in the farm or the factory, the workplace, the school or the home, use us to advance thy kingdom. Lord, help us, we pray, not to come to the end of our days with wasted years, regrets, and all fulfilled desires, but help us to work now, for the night is coming. And we have to lay, lay our work tools down and go home and present our work to the master. May we come with our sheaves May we come rejoicing, for we pray in the Saviour's name. And if there's one this morning in this gathering and they're not saved, we thank thee that the message that we're to take to the harvest field is the message we bring to the sinner Jesus saves. O oh Lord, work in hearts today. Bring sinners unto thyself. Be glorified in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen.